Welcome back to the lab, folks. Today, I just want to take a closer look at this uh, GM328A component tester. This thing is a rather extensive item compared to the other component testers that we've already looked at. And I guess that's why I, I think it deserves its own look because it, it's far more capable than any of the other ones so far. And probably not a good comparison between them. In fact, I found this uh, documentation online. Now, apparently there's no documentation from the originators of this. But uh, this documentation here by Stephen Bagts uh, at Z100 Lifeline, and I'll leave a, a link to it down in the description, is uh, uh, this is an extensive piece of documentation. This guy's gone through a lot of effort to put this together. It goes through all the different functions of this. And I don't know if we're going to touch upon all of them today, but it, I would like to sh show you off some of the unique properties of this tester. Like, you really need to go and look at this. If you're considering buying one of these, Go look at this documentation first and uh, decide then whether or not that this device is the right one for you. Now, he uh, built this documentation based on a kit that was available. I guess it was all surface mount part, I mean all through hole parts, I, I don't know. He doesn't talk about the kit at all really. And uh, this one here, uh, the one I've got, it's got uh, all surface mount parts on it. And it probably would be a, an advanced build. Um, as you can see on the back here, it's all surface mount stuff. This is the 328. It's a it's the brains of the organization here. It's got a USB-C power supply here that raises the test voltage up to 13. You could also put a 9 volt battery on here, which is I think what I'm going to do. I'm all set up to do that. Although this is not the kind of uh, battery holder I would I'd rather have, but I'll I'll get one of those later and update that. But the reason for for that is because the uh, if you just use the USB, you really have to do a calibration every time you use it because it loses that calibration information. Whereas if you supply it with a battery here, it'll retain that information. So I'm going to do that. Yeah, uh, th this seems rather extensive. So uh, let me get to that. Let me put that battery on here first and then we'll get started. Okay, we're back here. I've got it connected up to the battery clip with one of my 9 volt lithium ion rechargeable batteries. And I've got the shorting clip in it here to do the calibration. But I wanted to point out some of the things that this thing can do. I mean, it's it's got a, a PWM output for testing things that you need PWM for, such as motor controllers and stuff like that. It's got a voltage input, so you can t you can read voltages with like a multimeter. And it's also got a, a frequency counter input, so it'll measure frequencies. Plus, it, it has the ability to test um, infrared modules and test these temperature sensors as well, these DHT11s. So, I mean, that that's that's pretty cool. Yeah, so let's go through the calibration here to begin with. And let's get this centered on the screen here and we'll turn it on. So the calibration is a little bit of a dance. It'll self-test mode, yep. Isolate the probes, that means take this thing out. It should continue on by itself. And then it's gonna ask me to put a capacitor in. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna put that in. Okay, that's it. Test has ended. Calibration takes a little bit of time to do. That's why I don't want to use it with the USB-C. If you're okay doing that calibration every time, then okay. So let's uh, let's start putting components into it and see what it comes up with. Now um, let's try these coils first here. We'll see what this can make of them. Now I have I have actual tested uh, readings of them as well. So we can compare that test. So 43 millihenry and I, that's 431 microhenry tested with 9.26 ohms. This is right on. Now I want to show you the difference between this and this one. So that that's great. I like that very much. So with this one here, When I tested this with, uh, I didn't test the inductance before, but uh, I tested them afterwards when I got some little inductors in. And look at this, 65 millihenry and 9.5 ohms. The ohms is not too bad, but the inductance is way out. Let's continue testing, let's test this one here. So this one here must be the 47 microhenry. Okay, it doesn't go down to that level of resolution, but I got 44.7. So if you round that off, that would come out to point, 0.04 and the 
resistance I got was 1.5 ohms, so that's that's pretty close, 1.7. So far, it's been uh, deadly accurate. Let's go on to trying a couple of capacitors here. Now I have this one, capacitor here. I tested this one with an ESR of 6.19 ohms. Let's see what this makes of it. It's coming up with a uh, 10UF, which it, this is a 10UF, and the ESR is coming up with 3.8 ohms. So this matches the specification of the capacitor. All right, so let's try this capacitor here. Okay, well, that's actually what it is. Uh, the ESR is precisely what I tested with my high-end unit, 1.1 1 .1 ohms. This seems to be pretty good. So let's try a couple of LEDs here. The puppy's come down to visit me in the lab. He's sniffing around at everything. Just ignore him, he'll go away. All right, pretty good. It flashes the LED so you can get an idea what the color is. And we'll try a red LED here. Good. All right, we've got a couple of transistors here. Let's try those in there. PNP, yeah, it's a 2N3906, so that's right. All right, and this one here, a little MOSFET. Now, I don't have a JFET, but it's supposed to be able to tell them apart. It's supposed to be able to tell silicon control rectifiers, and all that fancy stuff, but I don't have any of those around. That uh, all looks very close to the specifications of this device. Okay, good. So we've just got a couple of resistors here to check. Now this resistor here checked out at 99.7 ohms. 97.5, a little bit off, not much. Okay, this tiny little one here, this is one of those little one eighth watt thing. This is supposed to be 300 and 30 ohms, I measured at 329, 328.3, so that's 327.6, 328.3, yeah, that's, that's close enough, that is close enough. All right, let's have a look at some of these other functions here. Okay, we're back here, I've got uh, these wires here set up, so that's ground, I checked ground, this ground is the same for all these blocks here. So I've got this one set up to the voltage in. I've got this one set up to, I think it's going to be frequency in, and this is set up for frequency out. So why don't we turn it on? And then let's go into the menu, which is a long press of that button there. And uh, so we'll go down to function generator here. And Okay, so it comes up at 100 mil or 1,000 millihertz, which is one hertz. Let me get that up on the scope there. Okay, we're in roll mode here, and you can see we're getting uh, frequency is one hertz. Okay, let's try, uh, let's go up here to two megahertz. And that's what we're getting at uh, two megahertz there. So frequency coming in just fine. The rise time about 57 nanoseconds and a 5.28 volts so the the voltage remains constant at least going up to that particular level let's try uh 500 kilohertz so frequency is coming in at 500 kilohertz voltage is a little bit higher at 5.328 volts and the rise time is uh yeah fairly constant around about 59 we're going to call it 60 nanoseconds okay let's bring it down to uh what do we got here we got 25 kilohertz we got a little bit of overshoot at this particular frequency. Let's uh, let's take it down to maybe one kilohertz. See what that looks like. Let's try the pulse width modulation. How do we how do we get out of here? Long press. Yeah. So pulse width modulation is the next one down in the menu here. And I'm assuming that's going to come out of the same output. Yeah. So I think we got the one frequency here which looked like it's at 7.8 kilohertz for some reason. Okay, we're looking at the positive uh, duty cycle here at 61%, and it agrees with this at 61%. Let's 
let's go down the other side let's go down to 37 percent and it's on the scope is 37 percent so that's perfectly accurate uh, now we're going to hook up a voltage source to it all right let me set up for that okay so we're on the voltage here I should be able to read a maximum external voltage of up to 50 volts DC. So let's see what we get. We've got voltage here. And we got 1.66 volts. Fluke is telling me it's 1.68 volts. So that is that is pretty good. Now yeah, let's bring that up. Okay, Fluke saying 5.03 volts. That's saying 5. Let's bring it up to 20 volts thereabouts. Okay, Fluke saying 20.11. That's saying 20.2. Let's bring it up to 40 volts. So I've got 40.9. I got 41.3. It's drifting off a little bit as we go up higher, but it's still pretty good. So I'm gonna get it up to 50 volts on the fluke. So the fluke is saying it's 50.03 volts, and this is saying it's 50.3 volts. So that's uh that's pretty good. That's actually uh really better than what I was expecting. Okay. I'm going to set up to measure some frequency coming into it, see what the frequency counter is like. We'll come back. All right, here we got it hooked up to a function generator. I've got the function generator set up for 1 kilohertz, 5 volts peak to peak with an offset of 2.5 volts DC. That means it's uh, from 0 volts up to 5 volts. Let's see what this does. Anyway, here we go. Frequency of 1 kilohertz. Period of uh, 1000.04. I don't know why they give the frequency twice. That's interesting. There's no explanation in here either as to what we're seeing. Okay, well let's uh, let's try it down to one hertz. Okay, it's got one hertz. Okay, a thousand milliseconds. So I guess uh, the, the first frequency is kind of what's rounding it off to uh, the second two parameters are the period and the frequency are more precise measurements. Okay, let's try 100 kilohertz. Okay, it doesn't bother with the period anymore. And according to the notes here, it says that it doesn't do that uh, above 25 kilohertz. So it just gives the frequency that it reads. Okay, let's try with 3 megahertz. It says 2.920. What happens if we go up to 4? Okay, it seems to be able to measure 4 megahertz fairly reasonably it's only off by about 16 kilohertz there that's not too bad so beat specifications on that really now we're at three volts peak to peak and 500 millivolts to offset so let's take all the offset out of it and we'll bring it down to a frequency within spec one megahertz and i'm going to start reducing the voltage to see when it drops out so we're at three volts peak to peak we're down to two volts 1 volt peak to peak, 500 millivolts, 100 millivolts. Okay, it's dropped out there. Let's try 200 millivolts, 300 millivolts, 400 millivolts. And needs a, a minimum of 400 millivolts peak to peak. All right. Oh, okay, yeah, that's pretty good. That's useful. Nice little frequency counter there. All right, so now I'm going to test some of the more esoteric things. Now, it turns out that this thing here, it is a, it's what's called a VS. 1838B and it is a infrared receiver. I should be able to put this in. I've got the pin out on it and everything else. So I'll set up for that and we'll try that out. Put on IR decoder and now I'm supposed to point a remote control at it and it works. So this I'm using this same RCA controller that I used with the other device. So it gives you uh, user code one and user code two data byte, byte 1, data byte 2, and the full 32 bits as well. All right, um, let me look up this uh, the pin out of this thing here, this temperature sensor, and we'll plug that in and see how it works. Okay, if I got this right in my head, this should kind of go, this is, this is VCC, data, and ground. So that should go in like this, with this non-connected pin sticking out. Okay, it's telling me it's a nice balmy 22 degrees C in here with a humidity of 37%. Let me uh, let me blow some wet air on it. Yeah, so humidity went up a bit there. Very nice. Oh, that's, that's pretty useful. This device is pretty useful device. 
Okay, it also is supposed to be able to check um, the DS18B20. I'm going to go and see if I have one of those things. Okay, happen to have a couple of them. Um, so it's ground, out, and VDD. So let's go in there, see what way we have to stick that in. Okay, straight in like that. And I remember the other thing said it was 22 degrees in here. I just handled that. So 23, it's saying 22. It's measuring a little bit lower than the DHT11, quite a bit lower actually. I wonder why that is. Okay. Well, there tells you where the, the data is coming out of it. Scratch pad RAM, the 64-bit ROM. Yeah, you know, that that's more like the temperature in here. So I, I'd say it's around about 17 degrees. So this is just going down from my body temperature. The DHT11 was a little bit optimistic. Okay, I didn't test diodes before. So let's try them now. This is just a 1 in 4148. That's... Yep, that's perfect. Yes, sir. Okay, now this here's a 1N60P. This is a Schottky diode. Nice. One of these zeners here, I think this one is an 8.1 volt. So that's getting up very close to the maximum voltage here. And see if it'll still do it. See, the maximum voltage is 8.9. No, it doesn't see it as a zener. Okay, according to the instructions, it'll only detect the zener if the zener voltage is less than 4.5 volts. So that's not incredibly useful. So, okay, here, this one's only a 5.1 volt one. So no, it, it can't get it. Well, that's it. Uh, this is an extremely handy device. There may be others out there that are even better than this. I don't know. But this one is a pretty substantial device. It, it does a lot of testing for you. Especially if, you, if, if you're the kind of person who mucks around with microcontrollers and from time to time requires to test out some of their sensors. It's a very handy little device and the output for frequency and pulse width modulation are also handy in that microcontroller world as is the input frequency. The voltage input, most of us have a DMM so I don't know how useful that is. But the component testing seems to be accurate. Okay. All right, that's all I have for you today, folks. I hope you found this interesting. And, uh, you know, it, if you're going to get one of these component testers, you don't already have one and are maybe not satisfied with the one you have, go get this document. Like I said, I'll leave a link to it down below. I'll leave a link to the device down below. And consider this one. I think of the three that I've tested so far, this one is definitely the best. I mean, it doesn't have the nice case that this one has and the socket here seems to be a little bit suspect it you know like if you look in there at some of these slots like the the blades are not completely open and stuff like that that wasn't the case with either of the other two the sockets worked really nicely but that's the only complaint I have about it is that it doesn't have a case and that socket there's a little suspect but other than that it's a very nicely featured device all right, folks, we'll see you in the next video. Please consider supporting me either directly through the PayPal link or by going to my AliExpress page and picking up something there. Other than that, we'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.